Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. At first blush, market volatility and fragility would appear to be two sides of the same coin. But for Ben Bowler and his global team at Bank of America, the last five years has uniquely seen muted overall daily volatility punctuated by occasional but extreme market outbursts. In Ben's role as global head of derivatives research, he has studied this period, one in which market kurtosis, that pesky fourth moment, has been substantially high. Perhaps owing to the conditioning wrought by the heavy hand of central banks, investors have, in Ben's rendering, increasingly competed for dip alpha. Thus, the market's growing tendency to lurch from calm to calamity as crowded positioning is unwound and then ultimately reestablished once the central bank asserts its desire to see easier financial conditions. The result is a remarkable change in the character of market volatility post-crisis. In addition to exploring the notion of fragility, my conversation with Ben considers the vol risk premium, the value of signals from the landscape of cross-asset volatility, and the impact of option selling on the market's gamma profile and resulting level of realized index volatility. We also broadly discuss the impact of risk control funds, the speed with which exposures can be de-risked, and the greater incidence of flash crash type events. Ben's insights are excellent. I hope you enjoy this discussion as much as I did. My conversation with Ben Bowler on this episode of the Alpha Exchange. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Ben Bowler. He is the Global Head of Equity Derivatives Research at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Ben, it is uh, great to have you on the program. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me, Dean. Appreciate you taking some time today, and I think we'll have a really excellent conversation about all things relating to volatility and market risk dynamics. We've seen a lot of action in the last couple of years, and I figured where where we would start is one of these tail risks that very few tend to talk about, which is the low vol tail risk of 2017. What a strange year to see the extent to which realized volatility in the S&P was was that muted. I'm curious if you can kind of set the stage for us in and around 2017 and as it evolved. What were some of the insights that you started to develop during this strange period of excessive calm? You're absolutely right to say it was strange. And not just in equity volatility. I mean, we developed a number of years ago some measures for cross-asset volatility. We have something called the Global Financial Stress Indicator we developed in 2010. And a component of that is cross-asset volatility measured across 13 different markets across four asset classes. And even that cross-asset volatility measure hit lows in 2014 that, that we'd never seen. Index goes back to 2000. In fact, you can find it on Bloomberg just by typing GFSI Go. But what's really remarkable is, as you noted, in equities, we have over 100 years worth of data. And in 2017, by some measures, we traded in the lowest, at the lowest level of volatility we'd seen in 100 and 110 years. The Dow traded in its tightest trading range since 1900. If you remember, the S&P also went for the longest period in its history since 1928 without a 5% pullback that ended in early 2018. So when we talk about yeah records, it is, it's a tremendous record. You know, our view has been that the real drivers of this incredible low vol environment really root back to the other unprecedented you know, factor in financial markets in the last 100 years, which is central bank policy. I mean, it's, it's been off the chart. The policy has been off the charts. And I think influencing markets much more significantly than perhaps people appreciate. It's an obvious statement to say that central banks have had a large influence on markets. I think it's hard to appreciate it until you see, I would argue, we would argue, you know, that policy driving century long records in the behavior of markets, again, viewed through this lens of volatility. I'm going back again to the 
2017 era. And I'm just remembering that, uh, I believe it was about November of 2017. So it's the 30 year anniversary of the stock market crash, October of, of 87, of course. But I'm remembering that the, the one month straddle on the S&P in and around November of 2017 cost one and a half percent of spot. It's just a remarkably low break even over the course of a month to think that you'd make money on either side if the market just budged. <laughs> and as you're noting, it just didn't. What's your view? Because I, I, I really thought a lot about this and I, I, I certainly don't have it answered, but I'd love to get your considered view on the, the sort of factors that worked maybe complicit with central bank policy on creating that degree of, of sidewaysness. A lot of folks are were saying at the time that vol selling was a part of it, kind of setting up the guardrails, so to speak. What's your sense on the supply of optionality into the market by folks trying to create and manufacture yield in a very low rate environment? How much weight do you put on the selling of options as a stabilizer of markets? Is that a big part of the explanation from your standpoint? It's a factor, but I would say it's it's one of many factors that ultimately drove that record low vol environment and, and frankly still contribute to some extent to the low vol that we're seeing today. But I think in terms of pure derivative selling, I like to say it's more icing on the cake than the cake itself. What really drives vol at the end of the day is the behavior of underlying asset markets. In other words, you know, the realized volatility day to day. And that low vol, in our view, was driven by a confluence of factors. But importantly, that confluence of factors, almost all of them point back to a single central driver, which is, again, this unprecedented central bank policy. But importantly, in combination with that policy's inability to drive faster growth and inflation. One of the factors that we've talked about for a long time is this linkage between interest rate, the interest rate cycle, and the volatility cycle. This goes back to some of our team's research from 2005, where we noted about a two-year lag between the turning points in the rate cycle and turning points in the vol cycle. And our argument at the time was, you know, that, that vol is really nothing more than a risky form of yield. So if you starve the market for safe yield by lowering interest rates, obviously we've seen some of the lowest interest rates in history in this post-GFC era, then you force investors to sell volatility for yield. But it's not just selling options. Almost any relative value strategy a hedge fund for example, would engage in is inherently short vol, right? You're looking for dislocations in asset prices and arbitraging them back to some sort of model fair value. In other words, you're monetizing excess volatility. But it takes time. It takes, you know, in our analysis, a couple of years for these feedback loops to sort of grind volatility lower. And that's a pretty normal, I think, driver of, of volatility through through the economic cycle and, and through the rate cycle. I think one of the other factors in this confluence of factors I mentioned, which has been absolutely critical to the super low vols that we saw in 2017, was unique to this particular cycle. And that was the unprecedented moral hazard injected into markets by central banks in teaching investors to buy every dip. And this really started, we've quantified this, it really started in most significance in around 2013 in the taper tantrum when, you know, Bernanke sort of did his Jedi mind trick and talked the market off the ledge, said there's no risk to see here, and the market clearly believed them. And, you know, as we talked about, vol fell to the lowest levels, uh, cross asset vol fell to the lowest levels in the subsequent summer in 14. But every subsequent pullback in markets from that point, really through Aug 15, the China deval event was met by, at minimum, verbal intervention, intervention by central banks and saying, and the Fed in particular saying, hey, don't worry, we're here, we've got your back. And that really taught investors to not fear risk, that, hey, if you have a free put, it's a fool's errand to buy puts, you know, the right trade is just to wait for dips and, and buy them. 
And it became so extreme that I think that we, we, we sort of called this the competition for dip alpha, where investors were had learned that the right trade was to buy every small pullback to the point where, as I said earlier, you know, we went for the longest period since 1928, ending in February of 18, without a 5% pullback. You couldn't wait for 5% dips anymore. You had to be harvesting 3% and 2% dips in order to compete in the market. And I think you know, that was a critical factor to driving the record low vol levels, equity vol, realized vol levels in 2017. Yeah, that was just remarkable, the degree of of calm in and around that period. And I certainly remember one of the narratives were that effectively dealer long gamma positioning was playing a role in, in muting volatility. We'll never know. And, and as I think you make a great point, there was so many things happening. Your point on the central bank put seems so important. And I wanted to get your thoughts on this whole concept of vol risk premium. AQR had written a paper, I want to say it's probably two years ago now, and they essentially went through the analysis as others have done and, and did it carefully and precisely, basically showing that there's a vol risk premium. And they make the point, I think their piece was entitled Pathetic Protection. And the idea was that even if you knew markets were going down, buying puts is still very, very difficult to get right because of, of the costs. You know, they show the back test of the vol risk premium over time. And the point I wanted to make was, well, sure, that's correct. But as you note, at each turn, you're getting some either verbal intervention at a minimum or actual policy reaction to sort of save the day. When we look at this vol risk premium over time, it's really in some ways, a, a, it's a fact, but it also is a fact in the context of the central bank's coming to the rescue each time. Do you think about it the same way, is that we're really measuring something that has to be in consideration of the reality that central banks tend to start to wave the red flag and, and talk the market at, off the ledge? The vol risk premia is sort of a, a topic in and of itself, and I think is a result of, generally speaking, inequities in particular anyway, has been a result of generally speaking, excess demand for optionality versus versus supply. And, you know, it's it's been ironically healthiest in the markets that are the most liquid. You know, I think oftentimes a mistake people make in thinking about buying protection, to your point, is that oftentimes investors sort of leave hedging as, a, as an afterthought. My primary expertise is in some sort of stock picking or asset allocation or quant, and then, well, I'm feeling a bit nervous, so I need to go buy some protection. Well, let me go to the most liquid market on the planet for protection, the S&P 500, and, and just, you know, it must, must be a fairly priced market. And the irony is that it's not. S&P are among the more expensive options out there, and in other words, have the most consistent risk premium because, you know, everyone thinks the same way that it's, you know, it must be fairly valued. I would argue that, you know, from a hedging standpoint, people need to put as much time and effort into thinking about how to buy hedges or how to protect their portfolio as they do in, in generating alpha, because every penny of excess premium you pay away for, for hedging that you could have done more efficiently is just a penny of, of alpha that you, you lost. All right. So I think that's where, you know, our research, in our research, we spend a lot of time trying to sort of be that, that advisor, if you like, on, on the hedging side in terms of where to find value. One of the uh, areas that I think you've done a, a real great job on is this, this notion of fragility. I want you to really lay this out because I do think it's fascinating. Before that, I, I'd love for you to, to share your thoughts on the sort of notion of the, the short vol exposure as an amplifier. I've had guests on the podcast, Veneer Bansali, uh, Chris Cole, really, really intelligent and, and super thoughtful guys on, on vol. And they've had strong views on just the, the size and the base of the short vol exposure and its potential to create an amplifying and kind of pro-cyclical move, you know, higher in vol and lower in asset prices to, to really create a, a substantial risk off if it really gets going. You make the point in some of your writing that the size of the vol market and the potential for loss from vol exposure 
is actually relatively small in contemplation of, let's say, the amount of credit risk that's on people's books and the amount of equity risk that's on people's books. I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting. Can you sort of uncover that a little bit? I know both Sunir and Chris and have a lot of respect for, for both of them. They completely agree they're very bright individuals. And in fact, we, Veneer and I, have debated this this topic a number of times at conferences as well. It's a big topic, but I guess just some high-level thoughts from my standpoint. At its core, the big question that everyone has is, you know, it's the Hyman-Minsky question. It's the question that, you know, Hyman-Minsky, the economist, very correctly stated that, you know, when, when volatility is artificially suppressed, you end up with a misallocation of risk capital when that misallocation of risk capital has to be unwound, it generally doesn't look very pretty. Having experienced that effect in 2007 and 2008, of course, a lot of people are asking the same question about what has been even lower levels of volatility, again, post-GFC versus pre-GFC. Are we setting ourselves up for another, you know, Minsky moment? Inevitably, I think the risks are rising, tail risks are rising the longer we manipulate markets, let's say, force volatility to be at levels which are not really a reflection of fundamentals, but are more a reflection of this incredibly powerful policy that has been put in place and all of the sort of incentives that have been driven around that. For example, the tendency to ignore risk that's been induced by this heavy provision of the central bank put. But I think the nuance here is really around the question of short vol or where the risks are. And some of the points that we've made are that the areas where some people look for risk, namely outright explicit short volatility strategies, quant strategies that tend to adjust with the level of volatility, so-called vol control funds, they may not be the right place to look for the for the real systemic risks. So I think I think one key point to make is that at the end of the day, a lot of people hear short vol and they get very scared. It sounds dangerous. It harkens perhaps to days of LTCM or other periods when short vol has gone really wrong. But short vol, you know, it really isn't the problem. It's it's leverage which is the problem to be more precise. And I would just highlight that, you know, everyone who's long risk assets inevitably is short vol, right? Your long equities, your short volatility, your long bonds, your generally short volatility, long credit anyway, you'd argue about treasuries or safer haven assets. But the point is that the explicit short vol landscape is relatively small in exposure compared to those larger pools and pockets of short vol. And the point, I think, which is important around some of the stories or concerns of risk-controlled funds in particular is that we can build models, we have built models, that track a lot of those strategies very closely. And, you know, in our models, through these stress events that we've seen in the last five to seven years, you know, these models have delevered 50 to 70 percent in some cases. And we know what that looks like in terms of market impact. It looks like AUG-15, or it looks like other types of similar periods of shock. The fact that these strategies are constantly stress-tested in our mind, I think, highlights that perhaps the risk is not as great as some people suggest. I think the risk probably is more concentrated in markets where there is not a a constant mark-to-market. I mean, that really was the origin of... 0708 was assets that weren't marked to market until it was far too late, and then the sort of rapid shift from marking to make believe to marking to market was really what kicked off the majority of the problems. You mentioned August 15. This is, uh, of course, the kind of surprise China, let's call it a quasi repeg, certainly a, a communication to, to the markets that what was expected was going to be in flux maybe not communicated efficiently, but what what a violent reaction in the VIX and in the S&P off a pretty low base, a reasonably calm in, in July of 15, and then something that I think the VIX got maybe intraday as high as 50. Didn't close there, but it got pretty high. Was there something special about the setup in terms of how you look at it 
going into August of 15 with respect to some of these systematic strategies? Were they especially long at that given point in time? When you look at the violence, the degree of reaction, how do you square the whole thing? A lot of the strategies which are trying to manage to a constant level of volatility, they are inevitably short what we call fragility. And just to come back to your earlier question on on fragility, the fragility is sort of a, a new phenomena in financial markets that we started to quantify back in 2014, uh, spent a lot of time on it in 2015. And it's really this idea that we're seeing the rise of what we originally had called local tail risks. That is, uh, an increase in sort of air gaps in markets, an increase in tantrums and flash crashes, which has really changed the whole distributional nature of asset of asset behavior. One way that we like to measure this is simply by looking at the rolling kurtosis of asset returns. And you're looking at the, not to get too complicated, but sort of the degree to which the last one year of historical returns are having significant outlier events compared to their current state. And the current state, of course, in the last five years has been one where vol has been incredibly low. So you're going from these environments where vol is is really low because of all these confluence of factors we talked about before, this harvesting of dip alpha. I would agree the to some degree, the influence of, of long gamma positions in 2017, which are just adding fuel to the fire. Again, I would say it's sort of icing on the cake, but it's all contributing to this environment. In that environment, it's very easy for volatility to have large percentage jumps. So it's very easy. It falls very low, let's say at three or four or five. If you realize volatility, let's say at four or five in S&P to jump to eight, that's a 100% increase a lot harder for it to go from 8 to 16 or 16 to 32, as you can imagine. And so that has a direct influence on the embedded leverage in some of these strategies. So that was a particularly challenging time where these fragility shocks in general, where vol starts being very low and then has a large percentage increase, that tends to be quite challenging. But again, I think the important point from a high level is that we know what significant deleveraging of these strategies looks like, and it looks like AUG15, which... I would draw a strong distinction between that type of event and something like 87 or 0708, which in the press anyway has been perpeted as a potential risk as a result of these sort of, you know, types of quant or short ball strategies. And that's where we would argue that it's a bit of a stretch, at least within that class of strategies. Running with this fragility concept, because I think it's so interesting and important and, and new for markets, we've seen these lurches higher in volatility, and then just as soon the market kind of forgets about it, and you see these almost violent retrenching of volatility as well. Can you put some of that into context? And I know you've created this fragility index as well. Be curious to learn a little bit more about the construction of that index, if you can share it. And then is there a way of quantifying the degree to which we see these sudden spikes in volatility, and then just as soon a very speedy decline as well. Back in 2015, when we first tried to quantify this distribution, this change in distributional characteristics of markets that we we call fragility, we had first started out by just looking at outlier of in our global financial stress indicator or a, a subset of factors in our global financial stress indicator, and it, it was it was useful and it quantified I think the change in, in distributional characteristics, but. Since then, we've expanded on that idea using, again, measures of realized volatility. So, again, not to get too complicated, but what I think is the bottom line is there's a number of different ways to to measure fragility. There's no one perfect way. We've seen fragility occur across a very broad number of assets. So you want to develop a measure that is able to encompass as many assets as possible And the measure that we've liked the most recently has been this idea of just looking at simply rolling kurtosis of asset returns because you can, for example, go back to 1928 in the case of the S&P and measure that over a very long time period. You can measure that across a very wide number of assets and aggregate that into a sort of broad market measure of fragility. 
So what's very fascinating is that if you look at this metric of fragility, which is simply just kurtosis, in the last 10 years or so, really post-GFC, we've had four times the frequency of these outlier events that we had from 1928 up until the GFC. So you can see a distinct change or structural break in the distributional characteristics of assets post-GFC. And again, I would point out that in our opinion, our view, the linkage between low vol and high fragility is actually very strong. In fact, what's remarkable is that if you aggregate fragility across asset classes, and we look at about 25 different assets where we measure this fragility behavior, it used to be the case historically that fragility and volatility were very correlated. So periods like 2008 or 2010, 2011, when volatility was high, you had high fragility. What's been really strange since 2014 historically is a decoupling between fragility and volatility. In other words, volatility has been incredibly suppressed, but fragility has been running between 50 and 80% of the levels that we saw in 2008. In our view, the reason that that has occurred is that even though you've had this relatively high frequency of, of shocks, jumps, flash crash tantrums, they've been very quickly suppressed again by this moral hazard injection by central banks and depressing volatility. And that's led to, as you were noting earlier, very rapid declines in volatility as investors have stepped in to compete for dip alpha to sell volatility post shocks. That's been a remarkable change in the characteristic or behavior of volatility since 2014. Well, one of the things that you've done is is kind of correlate the low vol environment and a highly fragile environment with the decline in alpha availability. From your standpoint, what's the connection there between those three? This is really important. I think one of the reasons that we think looking at volatility is so important for anyone, not just those that trade derivatives, is the, I, I think, the understanding it can give you into some of the absolute key questions that every asset manager today faces, any active manager anyway, has been facing in the last five years this question of, you know, where is the alpha gone? If you look at a rolling returns of, of hedge funds, since the GSC, we've gone from sort of mid to high single digit returns down to a few percentage points of returns for hedge funds. It's been a fairly steady decline. If you look at the percentage of active equity managers outperforming their benchmark in the S&P and the U.S. against the S&P, for example, we've gone from around 50% around 08, 09 down to 30 to 35% by 2018. So it's been a tremendous Tremendously difficult environment for actives. The conundrum has been, why has it been so difficult for active managers to generate alpha when the environments looked so benign on the surface? We're sitting here, you know, with equities, U.S. equities anyway, at all-time highs. Volatility, as we talked about, has generally been low. If you ask a man on the street how professional money managers should be doing in this environment, they would probably suggest they're doing very well. But of course, that's not the reality, and that presents this conundrum. Why has it been so difficult to generate alpha in an environment that looks so healthy on the surface? In our view, it's very much linked to the question of why has volatility been so low? And if you think about it from a statistical standpoint, as central banks have come in and take so much control over markets, you just look at the degree to which markets are really hinging on every word of the Fed and how their policy is changing and how perception of that policy is changing today. But the point is that as they've taken so much control, they have subjugated traditional fundamentals. They've made them less relevant. And in other words, if you were to, and again, not to get too kind of quantitatively complicated, but if you were to run a principal component analysis on asset returns, meaning that you're trying to associate asset returns with various factors that drive them. What you would generally see is in this post-crisis era when central banks have taken so much control, you'd see a greater loading 
on a narrower set of policy factors, right? Now let's do a little thought experiment and take this to an extreme. If there was only one factor driving all asset returns, if everything was just some beta to a policy factor, there would only be one trade in the market, right? You would either be on the right side or the wrong side of that factor. And we're not saying it's gone to that extreme, but it's approached that direction. So what happens then is you end up with too much capital chasing too little alpha, and the result of that is crowding, which has been one of the primary problems that investors have faced in the last five to seven years as well. People crowd into the same trades, uh, not because they have conviction, but because they're working. As alpha has been starved from the system and passive continues to generate inflows, you've also had a very strong fear from actives about losing assets to passive, for example. So that creates a closet momentum behavior where you're chasing trades that are working, again, just because you're too fearful of losing performance. When the tide turns and the trade becomes no longer in fashion, of course, you want to get out very quickly because you've got no conviction in the position you're in. You're there because it's working, and now it's just stopped working. So you have this rush to exit. And to add more pain to the story, unfortunately, liquidity is drying up at record speed as stress rises for another set of reasons having to do with the behavior of HFT capital. But that, in our view, is sort of given rise again to high fragility. So it's, again, this this connecting the dots between unprecedented low volatility, unprecedented high market fragility, and unprecedented challenges for active managers in generating alpha in an environment, again, that, that looks on, on the surface so, so healthy. And in fact, if you look at passive, if you look at the behavior of performance of passive investments, remember 2017, the Dow Jones generated a sharp of four. I was in the like 95th or beyond percentile since since 1900. The S&P had a sharp of 3.8. I mean, most managers would would give their right arm for those type of returns. So at the same time, when active has been challenged, passive has been doing very well. Partly because central banks have supported asset prices, but also very importantly because they've suppressed volatility so successfully. And that's, I think, you know, again, this sort of big picture perspective, which is really important for everyone to to appreciate it, in our opinion. You linked fragility with, with liquidity, and I thought it might be useful to spend a little bit of time on 2018 because we've got the year is kind of bookended by shocks. I'd love to get your thoughts on a characterization because they feel very, very different. I think the closing price of the VIX in and around February of 18 and then in and around December of 18 is the high is probably about the same. I think it got to 35 or something on a closing basis, but very, very different. And one of the things that occurred as a function of the XIV blow up is, well, the S&P options market effectively was untradeable for a period of time, which is very, very rare and a little frightening for the most liquid risk benchmark to not be tradable. But in the aftermath of that XIV event, Many folks were pointing to this decline in depth in S&P futures. I'd love to get your take on on that the, and the implications of it and maybe tie it back to some of your framework on volatility. I think one of the reasons in our view that markets have become more fragile is this issue of alpha starvation and of crowding. But at the same time, we've seen in the last 10 years this trend towards liquidity in agency electronic markets also failing during periods of, or being significantly hampered during periods of, of high volatility of the, or these fragility shocks. One of the contributors to that, in our view, has been the challenges that market making and HFT in particular has had in terms of profit potential. I mean, if you look at the profitability of of market making and HFT in general in the last 10 to 15 years, it's been on a fairly steady decline as as volatility has declined, but importantly as volumes in markets have declined. There was a big arms race, I think, 10 or 15 years ago to build the greatest technology and so forth, and the returns on all that investment, I think, have generally been 
declining in this declining environment. So what you have, I think, is an attempt by these liquidity providers to improve risk-adjusted returns of their business by simply reducing risk because you can't generate any more returns. So how do you reduce risk? Well, you don't get involved. In other words, you stop providing liquidity when stress materially rises because that's, you know, that's the period when risk is the highest for you to provide that liquidity. And there's a feedback loop, of course, because if you're the one that got caught in the last event, well, you're going to be more incentivized to not participate in the next, in the next event. In S&P, we've seen, you know, record low order book depth during periods of shock. We've seen a very strong correlation between the VIX, let's say, and anti-correlation between the VIX and order book depth. So VIX spikes, order book depth falls. But interestingly, one of the other examples of a high fragility event was actually in the treasury market in October 14 in the, we called the growth tantrum. We had the largest intraday move in treasury yields relative, again, to the trailing volatility in the market. In other words, a high fragility event, one of the largest shocks we've seen since the 1960s in treasuries. And what was interesting was that market had become increasingly electronified leading into that. So to us, at least in the agency electronic markets, this is another contributor to this, again, structural break in the behavior of asset prices that we've seen post post GFC. The other point which is key is that these events we've seen and talked about mostly have been in agency electronic markets. You could argue that there are also increasing risks within markets that are more dependent on bank balance sheets because of, again, the reduced balance sheets that that have happened post GFC as a part of the change in regulatory environment. And the question, I think, is whether we've really seen a true sort of shock to those markets and what that would look like. In other words, you know, if we have a fragility event, we really test that liquidity. That's something I, I would be somewhat concerned about just given the experience we've seen in agency electronic markets in the last 10 years. What was your work like in the, let's say, latter part of 2017? We, we mentioned that uh, that was sort of the height of the low realized period. I think we towards the end of December in 2017, we probably got down to three or four percent on a one month basis in the S&P. It was just remarkable. And then, of course, we started 2018 with a hot hand in markets. They went straight up. The sharp ratio wasn't three or four. It was if you annualized, it was like 20 or something like that. But then, of course, we ran into this big XIV event. What's your take on XIV? Is it it's come and gone and it's it's not a symptom of of other dangers in markets? It's one off or what sort of implications or conclusions should we draw from the materialization of the event? I can't speak really to any any specific product, but what I would say is that leading into 2018, I think we were we were concerned about the leverage being built up within certain products in the VIX space, like many others. If I, if I recall, I think you were also highlighting concerns as well. So it was, you know, to people that were really knowledgeable about the space, frankly, again, going back to this point about short vol not being the problem, but leverage being the problem, I mean, there was a lot of embedded leverage in some of these products. That was a concern. I think we had actually even had published a hedge specifically for that in our outlook for, for 2018 that we published in Deck 17. But what we, where we, I think where we think we differed from some others is this idea that that risk was big enough to sort of generate 87 style shocks, or some people had even suggested, you know, much larger potential shocks. Again, if you just looked at that complex and looked at the exposure it was very small in the orders of several billion compared to the losses that were made just on the S&P or U.S. equities declining over the same period. So, again, I think sometimes the risks are exacerbated in terms of the spillover effect. Our view is that, you know, the VIX product complex was definitely a uh, an area of risk that could take itself out, but we were a little more skeptical on that sort of driving a global systemic problem the bigger issue at that around that period of time, and the, what we were really saying going into 2018, was that markets had been on autopilot really since Brexit, 
with the idea that buying every dip was the right trade to the point where central banks didn't need to say anything anymore, right? Our view was that under then new Chair Powell, it was likely that the put strike was in fact lower than the market understood, but it was going to take a shock to prove that to the market. Because as long as the market's on autopilot buying every small dip, you know, it doesn't realize that the protection has sort of faded away. And the Fed 18 shock, I think, was that event. That really drove, in our view, the sort of structural break higher in equity volatility that persisted through most of 2018. The key question now, of course, is with the massive U-turn that the Fed made in, in January of this year, whether we're getting pushed right back down into this world of, of hyper central bank control and you know, whether this sort of bubble in volatility, as we called it, is, is likely to persist. I think as long as markets have faith in central banks and central banks are very nervous about markets, I think the risk is that we can fall back into this sort of bubble environment, which in the long run is unsustainable and in the long run is increasing tail risks. But you know, the, the question, of course, is timing. When does it start to really unwind? Well, you make the point that this cross-asset volatility framework, which I'd love for you to expand upon because you do a lot of work in this area, is useful in uncovering some of the hidden risks and trying to get to where that central bank put is struck. We look around the world and we've got you know, some vols in the sort of middling percentiles. FX vol has been notably low and rates vol was too, except for the last month or so. As you look at the the world of risk premiums and the price of options and and the surfaces, what does the setup look to you amidst uh, 3,000 in the S&P and minus 35 basis points on a German tenure? I mean, it's a strange environment. What's your take on it all? What is the current landscape of the price of risk maybe set against what central banks are, are doing or saying? What does that look like to you? The interesting phenomena post the Fed's U-turn in January was that bond markets clearly saw that as being a vindication of their relatively uh, pessimistic outlook on growth, and they celebrated that by rallying fairly strongly. Equities, of course, celebrated the return of the Fed put as they saw it and celebrated and rallied as well, which which gave rise to very strong performance in any kind of balanced you know, bond equity fund, including things like risk parity. But what's interesting is that bond markets globally reacted in line with equity. Okay, So they collapsed because, again, the lesson that they learned in the last, you know, five, seven years has been, well, you know, if you have a free put, you know, it's a fool's errand to buy one. The right trade is to not panic. The, the natural reaction is that vol collapses when you've got that kind of support. What we were saying, what we've been saying this year is that, well, what's interesting is that if the bond market's actually correct and the next move indeed is a cut, this was early on in 2019 when people were still debating what the next move would potentially be, then, you know, if you look at the history of, of volatility, particularly rates vol, it's not priced for the potential of a cut. Historically speaking, rates falls very consistently risen into the first cut in rates going back in the last 20 years or so. So we've seen in the last month or slightly more, we've seen rates fall finally react and rise fairly strongly. The we call safe haven vols would be rates, ball and gold, and let's say dollar yen. Gold, again, was lagging the rise in rates fall, at which point we were saying, in the last couple of months, well, you know, this is sort of strange because rates fall is already signaling risk. You know, given the backdrop, it seems like gold vol should react as well. And sure enough, not too long after we saw, obviously recently, a pretty strong reaction in gold vol. FX has not really reacted yet. But just to go back, I just to make a broader point, looking at cross-asset vol in our experience is quite useful because – while at the end of the day, cross-asset vol is ultimately linked by the same macro drivers, it's driven in general by investors who are still very asset class siloed, meaning that there's not a lot of capital that is actively arbitraging. There's certainly not enough capital that's sort of actively arbitraging cross-asset volatility. 
to make that market efficient. In fact, my prediction is that in my lifetime, I will never see a cross-asset vol market that really is sort of efficient in that sense, which is why it's so important to to look at it because it can give you quite nice early indications of things that may happen by spotting balls that are temporarily, you know, dislocated or, or disconnected. That's what I think is, is so interesting about where, where where we are where we are today is you know vol markets again don't seem uh, entirely fair relative to the uh, forward outlook that I think most investors would have at this point. Well, it's such an interesting conundrum, and you, you pointed to it, which is the bond market rallied really strongly off of body language and statements from the Fed, and maybe the ECB we can throw in there as well. And in some ways, it was the rally in the bond market that took the S&P higher. You know, maybe it's the there is no alternative type argument or discounting of cash flows or lower and lower rates. But you would think in the risk on risk off framework that lower yields and lower stock prices would come at the same time. And yet, even as stock and bond prices are negatively correlated, if you look at the daily return series, both the stock market and the bond market have, have risen in tandem. It's a it's a fascinating setup. And, it, you know, you mentioned Brexit. It, today's setup reminds me a little bit of that post-Brexit period because there was that violent rally in the bond market. And then after the Brexit fears faded, the stock market kind of took off as well. So much of this links back to inflation or the lack of inflation. And I've seen in some of your work this notion of underpreparedness, I guess, for investors and, and their portfolios with regard to a, an inflation shock of some kind. No one can really surmise a scenario in which inflation becomes an issue, and maybe that itself is the issue. I'd, I'd love to get your take on it as you kind of talk to clients and portfolio managers, how they describe the risks of inflation. It's fair to say that almost no one foresees any inflation anywhere. It's certainly been, I guess, the other $64,000 question, why why we haven't seen it given the massive policy easing. Of course, a lot of arguments there that one could drill into. But I think from our standpoint, what's really important is just to appreciate that, you know, the ability for central banks to continue to control markets in the way that they have done is ultimately a function of inflation. In other words, what we would say is that inflation is really sort of the the kryptonite for volatility in that it undoes all of these factors, almost all of these factors that have been suppressing volatility. It will drive fundamental volatility higher, which should drive FX and and rates fall higher. It will cause interest rates to rise, of course, which, which will make selling volatility less attractive as per the relationship I noted earlier. But but absolutely critically, the only reason that central banks have been able to adopt this third mandate of supporting asset prices and effectively targeting volatility, although I don't think they think of it like that, I think they think of it probably as more supporting asset prices, has been possible because they have not been constrained on their primary statutes, or at least in the the Fed's case, their statutory mandates of maintaining employment and inflation. As soon as they're constrained, they're handcuffed. They're no longer able to step in and say, oh, you know, I know equities are down 10 percent, as Yellen did in, as Chair Yellen did in September of 2015. I know equities are down 10 percent, but don't worry, we're going to put rates on hold for the time being. That ability disappears as inflation rises. So, again, even though it's, it's very difficult to see when, and certainly it's, I don't think, on really anyone's radar screen at the moment, it is important from a sort of a 100,000 foot perspective to appreciate that the linchpin to this whole story holding together of a manipulated central bank manipulated market of low volatility and low alpha and high fragility to some degree does hinge on inflation staying at bay. I know central banks have been so active in markets post-crisis. It's been without precedent. I can't help but ask you, as you sort of step back and look at German 10 years at some point traded below the deposit rate to trade it at minus 40 odd basis points. Austria just issued a 100 year bond for 1.2 percent and Italy a 50 year for 2.4 percent. What is your take on this? Any just big picture thoughts on 
what allows asset prices to set at these levels and for these yields, which seem vastly unappealing and dangerous to be incredibly oversubscribed. When they come to market, they're met with massive demand. What does that tell us about the state of market dynamics? Yeah, I think it tells us that the world is becoming more like Japan. I spent the early part of my my career actually working in Japan and building our research group there. It was a wake-up call arriving there some 20 years ago, having grown up in the U.S. where, you know, you learn that asset prices always go up. And, of course, at that point in time, you'd never seen a, a nationwide housing downturn. And, you know, you just have a certain perspective on markets. You land in Japan and you realize that things are very different. When I was there in the late 90s, I think the Nikkei was about a quarter to a third of its level 10 years before at the peak of the Japanese bubble. Yields obviously were quite low. So I think in Japan, to some degree, has paved the way towards this environment. And I think you know, the, the parallels, as quite popularly talked about, with Europe in particular, are fairly strong. That is the conundrum that the key question, are we able to escape this environment of the extreme heavy hand of central banks and if not you know is it just a matter of time before other markets globally you know suffer the same fate i think looking at japan can give you a lot of you know insight into you know how things may play out interestingly one of the implications i think which is important is or one of the observations which is important is that at some point i think central banks stop having the ability to influence vol so so effectively. I mean, if you look at the Japanese markets, they're not the least volatile markets on the planet, even though you could argue that they've had the most application of central bank support, even including central banks buying equities. So at some point, there is a limit to the extent to which I think this incredible policy can can suppress volatility. I don't think we're quite there yet in terms of, of losing that credibility in the U.S., but, you know, the the risk is, I think, in Europe, you're clo- maybe closer to that. With European rates and vol so low now, it doesn't look to be that way, you know, at, at present. But I think, again, looking at Japan as a sort of a, at least a, a guidepost to where things could be going is um, is useful. What the secular stagnationists will argue is that these are really long range demographic type results that aren't going away anytime soon. And that Rather than pulling rates down, the central banks are just kind of following them down. And I personally have become a little bit more sympathetic to the thesis. As we wrap up, I'm just curious if you can share what is truly top of mind for you and your team, areas of research and investigation that you guys are especially excited about now? Most of our work that we've talked about in this session has really been about our, our work on, on the macro environment and, and volatility. But one other area of research that we have also been focused on the last 20 years is sort of quantitative investment strategy that is really trying to harvest the same risk premia that uh, hedge funds, for example, have enjoyed for many years, but to do so in a more systematic rules-based strategy. We've really been pushing on this sort of leveraging of basic tools from machine learning to build sort of superior quantitative investment strategies, which we've been quite excited about. And that's been another big area of focus for for our research team. Well, Ben, this has been a great conversation. Really appreciate you taking the time to share your excellent insights with us. Thanks a lot. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. I uh, really enjoyed it. You've been listening to the Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. 